So we started a series last week called Daily Bread, and we're looking at the Lord's Prayer. It's a very popular prayer. Um, I was raised Catholic, and so we, we prayed the prayer every week. We, we said it together um, as, a, as a church. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of power in that prayer. The prayer was given by Jesus when the disciples asked Jesus to teach, teach them how to pray. And so, you know, it's, it's funny to me, not funny, but I think it's interesting that of all the things that the disciples could have asked Jesus to teach them, prayer was at the top of the list. And so when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, Jesus just begins to pray. We looked at the couple of verses before this prayer last week. Um, he talked about how, you know, getting in your prayer closet and getting quiet and, and all of those things. And then we really only looked at the two first words of, of this prayer found in Matthew 6. And I want to kind of finish that line today. And so I want to just read a few, uh, really one verse, uh, Matthew 6. Again, Jesus is praying in front of his disciples because they wanted to know how to, how to pray and see results. And Jesus says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So the best that I can tell this prayer is, is the power is not so much in the saying of it, but in the praying of it. And that it's, it's good to memorize this prayer, and I think a lot of people have, but there's, it's not so much the, the 66 words or the, you know, the, just rehearsing the prayer. The, I think the real patter, power is in the pattern that Jesus gives us. He tells us not only how to pray, but he, he starts and kind of gives us categories. And last week, we looked at the first two, two words, which were the most important. Coming to God, our, our approach to God is, is really the most critical part of our prayer life. Because nobody's going to ask anyone for anything that if in our minds we don't believe that they care about us or that they like us. You know, like it's kind of like that teacher that, that is, you know, maybe not the nicest teacher in the world. And, and you don't even want to go to their desk and ask them anything because they're busy and, and they're short with you. Like, like, and so Jesus is trying to, I think, shift our perspective on those first two words that when we come to God, we come to God and we look to him as father, as full of compassion and mercy, that, that God wants to answer our prayers more than we want to ask that he's a good father. And so we, we established that last week. And then he jumps right into this, our father in heaven. And so when, you know, at face value, I really believe that that meant that's, that was God's home. You know, so we pray to our father and he lives in heaven. And, but the more I thought about that, it really immediately presents a gap between us and God. And here we are on earth and our father is up in the heavenly sky, you know, thousands of light years away, and that's where he lives. And so it's, it's almost creates this distance that, that God isn't near, that God's in heaven and we're down here on earth trying to figure this all out, not go crazy, you know. And, 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 but I, I think that what Jesus is really saying here is it's not so much a destination, but it's, it's, it's about who, G, who God the father is. It's, it's, it's not his home, it's his heart, that he's in heaven. And when we think about heaven, we, we think about a perfect place that's in complete harmony. There's no tears, according to Revelation. There's no pain. There's no death. There's no suffering. And when Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father in heaven, it's not a destination, it's a description of God. That we're, we're coming to a God whose ways are higher than our ways. We're coming to a God who, who, what we're worried about, more than likely, he's not really worried about it. That, that, he's, that he's, he's perfect. He's all-knowing. He's all-seeing. And so, so it's not that God's far away. It's, it's describing what he's like. Psalm says this about God, that the Lord is near to all those who call on him. And so our Father in heaven, it gives us a picture of, of who we're approaching and who we're talking to, that, that our God is perfect in his ways. And, and a little later in this prayer, the next piece of this prayer is, is really we're trying to pray for God's rule and order to happen here on earth. 
right? It's your kingdom come. It's your will be done. And so we're describing this God who has our life and your life and the chaos of the world all settled in his heart. He knows where it's going. He knows the end of the story. He knows the beginning of the next chapter. And so this is not a distance thing. This is, I want you to see the heart of God, that he's perfect, that his wisdom and his counsel to you is gonna be better than anyone else could give you, that he's perfect. He's it's our father in heaven. And then he goes to this next piece that is really what I wanna focus on today. Hallowed be thy name or hallowed be your name. And for the longest time, I thought it was hollow be your name. <laughs> and so I, I, I didn't really know. I prayed it. You know, I, learned, I was raised Catholic, and so we said it every week, but I didn't know what hallowed. I mean, nobody really uses that word much, hallowed. hallowed. Like, what does is, what is hallowed really mean? And, and I think it's a twofold thing, a twofold thing. Hallowed be your name. So, so we come to God as Father. We know his ways are perfect. And, and, and this is not a song, like, hallowed be thy name. This is not a praise. This is not something that, that we're saying or describing. But it, it's, it's, this is the first request in the Lord's Prayer. It's the first request. And it's twofold. It's that God would reveal his glory in the world and that he would reveal himself to me personally. Hallowed be your name. It's a request. It's God, I, I, I want you to show the world who you are and I wanna know you in a deeper way. And this morning, I, the, I wanna talk about the mystery of prayer because the mystery of prayer is that those two things we really cannot do in our own strength. When you think about when we, what happens when we go to pray, and I've heard incredible stories already this week about different people's prayer life. And I, 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 someone called me and, and shared with me that, that they, they pray on the way to work every morning and, and they just envision that God is in the driver, the passenger seat with them. And I've heard different stories about different rhythms and rituals that people have in their prayer life. But it's, it's a mystery. Like when you really think about what all is happening when we fold our hands to pray, when we come to church and we bow our heads, it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit prompting us. So it's God in us, right? But, you know, we, I don't think that we naturally are born with this desire to want to pray. I think we naturally revert to our own strength and our own, the Bible calls it our flesh, that we're going to figure it out on our own. I'm going to be my own God. I'm, I'm the captain of my own soul, right? You've heard that. I'm, I'm the, I, I, you know, where I end up in life is up to me. I think that's how we're naturally born. But this is saying, no, 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 that prayer is a realization that we are not the captain of our own souls, <laughs> that we came from somewhere and we're going back to that place, that there, there, is a, there is a higher order in the world. And when we fold our hands to pray, it's God in us, the Holy Spirit in us, praying to God that's beyond us through God who died for us. It's a mystery. That prayer, it begins and it ends with God. And, and there's no way that we can take, you know, and I think it takes the pressure off of us. Because when we come to God, we know we're not coming in our own strength and our own merit. That it's the Holy Spirit that put it in our minds and heart to pray. That the only way that we have a shot of our prayer getting to God was a man named Jesus who gave his life thousands of years ago, who, who was the mediator between us and God. And we know that he hears our prayer because of what he did for us. And so it's this, it's this beautiful mystery, I think, in my mind, that it's God in us praying to God that's beyond us through the God who gave his life for us. And before Jesus teaches the disciples to ask for daily bread, to forgive their trespasses, before we start praying for any of our needs, he says, the first thing you should think about and pray for is that God's name would be lifted up in the earth. That you would recognize God in the world and in your own personal life. And it's interesting because he says, hallowed be thy name, but he doesn't give a name. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> Like, hallowed be thy name. He could have said, you know, he could have given, there's so many names for God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we're not gonna go, there's a lot of names for God. But I, I wanna go back to the first time that God gave his name to a person. 
the first mention, the first time and that God revealed his name to an individual. And the man's name was Moses. And you, you may know the story of Moses. We talked about him a little bit last week. Moses and God had a really tight relationship. That, that there was a point where, where Moses was really unhappy and God changed Moses' mind. And then there was a point in Moses' life where God was really unhappy and Moses changed God's mind. And so they had this beautiful relationship. But it all, it started here, you know, it started in, in, in the desert. And it says that, that Moses made a mistake. He kind of got ahead of God. He knew that he was supposed to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, but he, he kind of said, I'm going to do it my way. And he got upset one day and he killed somebody, right? We've all been there. And so like, it, it happens. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's been some times in traffic where I've thought about it. Okay, I've really thought about it. Like, <laughs> so, I'll just be honest. And, uh, and so Moses did it. Uh, he got really mad at the way his people were being treated, and he killed an Egyptian soldier, and then he had to flee. So he got ahead of God. He had the right desire, but he took it in his own hands and his own strength. So he's in the desert taking care of his you know, father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. And, and this is what happens, Exodus 3. It says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He'd been there hundreds, probably thousands of times. And it was there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'm going to go over there and, and see. He was curious. What's going on here? Am I hallucinating? Have I been in the desert too long? Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. And God said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. From that verse on, the rest of Exodus 3 is a conversation between Moses and God. It was God speaking to Moses saying, okay, your time has come. I know you thought that, I, that you, were, you were done. I know you thought that you know, what I put in your heart would never happen, but it's time. And so Moses, I just want you to catch this. Moses was just doing his job. He'd probably seen that bush a thousand times. Like he had gone and got water at the water cooler at work a hundred times that month, Right? Like it's just this ordinary routine that Moses was in and all of a sudden God speaks to him. He wasn't in a church. He wasn't on a retreat. He wasn't in a monastery. He, he didn't take a, sign, you know, a vow of silence. It was just doing his ordinary everyday job. God shows up and he gives him an assignment. And Moses was a little bit insecure. He had a stuttering problem and he's like, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I'm I'm, I, he was a, a fugitive, like he was on the run. And this is what God says to him in verse 13. If I, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, that's what they called God up to this point, the God of your fathers. And they ask me, what is his name? What am I going to tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell them that the Lord sent you. So a few things about this story, then we're going to pray. Four things I, I, I feel like is happening. That prayer is a conversation that begins with recognizing God. Prayer is answering speech. Prayer is, is responding to what we see God doing in our world and in our life. And then for Moses in that, that certain story and setting, he was just taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, probably thinking that I'm going to die in the desert. And he had walked by this random bush a gazillion times, and then all of a sudden, God is speaking through it. And so prayer is a conversation that begins with recognizing God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I see you, Lord. I see what you're doing in my life. I, I see what you're doing in the world. It, it, it begins with seeing God. And, and I think the, the reason for me that I've, I, you know, I felt this resistance in prayer, and I felt like God told me that you're not, you don't have much to say to me because you don't see me. 
You have to see me working in the lives of people. You have to see me working in the pain and in the struggle and in all the things that are happening in our world. It's really easy to get bitter. It's really easy to to retreat and say, how can God be in this mess? And how can God be in this? I mean, I've gone to the same job every day the last 25 years. I'm, you know, like, how can God be in this boring routine? And he's there. But sometimes we don't see it. And I think for Moses that the ground didn't become holy all of a sudden. It was just that Moses became aware of it. It wasn't that God all of a sudden showed up in that bush. He was keeping that bush alive from the moment he spoke this earth into existence. That he was there. And it wasn't like this, this, this great thing happened. It was just Moses became aware of the presence of God. Elizabeth Browning says it like this, earth's crammed with heaven. In every common bush is a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. Four things that I believe has helped me recognize God in my life. Four, four things. And this, the list is long, but I want to give you the things that I, I believe have helped, have helped me. And the first one is, is we recognize God through creation. Through creation. Before we had this book, God created the world. And before, you know, we're talking about a man, Moses, who maybe didn't have the the written word of God. He got the original Ten Commandments from God, but it was the creation. That's that's where they seen and experienced and recognized God. For Moses, it was this burning bush. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's, I just think it's really hard to go outside and, and just leave here and go sit on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico and not believe that there's something greater in the world than you and I. That before I ever found God in church, I found him in creation. That there was just things that happened that were undeniable. There, I, I felt him speaking to me, and, and I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what was going on, but I, I just knew that I wasn't alone in the world that there's no way that some explosion happened millions of years ago and then some lizard climbed out a sludge and turned into a monkey and then turned into a human. I mean, it takes more faith to believe that than an intelligent design, that there's got to be a creator, that there's no way that this just happened. And creation is, is full of God's glory. Now, this is a problem in our culture, because the last statistics that I read, that the, the average person now in America spends 90% of their life inside. 90%. We have artificial light. We have artificial climates. We have fake fireplaces and wax fruit and artificial smells. We don't go to the beach. We spray sea breeze for breeze. <laughs> you know, you know the, I, which, I mean, I'm not... But the, like we've got a fake thing for everything that God has created. Jack Johnson, I like Jack Johnson. In one of his songs, he says, the wisdom's in the trees, not the glass windows. Get outside. It's really hard. I mean, I, I really believe that God is speaking through his creation if we're just willing to, to see. And we've gotten to the point in our culture now where we don't pray for rain anymore. We want to make it rain. We're engineering it. We're, we're, we're trying to play the role of God. And, and, and I just, I mean, I think that we're missing something there. One pastor that I, I talked to, he calls them glory walks. The earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. And so he gets in nature. That's how he prays. He gets in nature, goes on a walk, goes, walks the trail, walks the beach, gets on a bike, does something outside. And I think it's so important because it's the one thing that's not controllable anymore. What you see on your screens is manipulatable. The first time I really felt like God talked to me, I was a, I was a little kid. My grandmother had, had just passed. And my grandma was, I was, she was like my best friend. Of all my grandparents, my grandma was the only one I really had a relationship with on my mom's side. And so my, my, her brother, my uncle, drove a U-Haul to 
Buffalo, New York, loaded all her stuff up and brought her down here to Florida. And she spent the last few years of her, of her life here in Florida. She loved the beach. She taught me how to play Texas Hold'em. She taught me how to play poker. Um, yeah, I mean, she, she, she was just really fun. And, 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 and I knew she, lo- she was just an awesome person. And, and when she passed away, it was the first time I can remember really grieving as a kid. Like, I missed, I missed her. I missed her being around. And um, I lived on my bike growing up out in, in Milton. I rode my bike everywhere. I rode my bike to school from about third grade. And, you know, I just loved riding my bike. I didn't want my mom to take me. I didn't want to ride a bus. I like riding my bike. And one day I was riding my bike down. It was Robinson Point Road. It was a pretty good trip from the school. And I started to get kind of depressed. Started thinking about my, mom, my grandma and missing her. And, and this, this white egret flew by. I and mean, I'm a kid. I'm a little kid. And I just felt like it was God's way of, of reminding me that I would see my grandma again. And from that, I mean, this was, this was like, gosh, this was over 20 years ago. And still to this day, I can be at four pickings with my family. Y'all could call me a hippie, I know. But I can, I like, if I see a, a snowy egret, I think of my grandma. I, f- I feel like it was God's way of, re- of just, just reminding me, showing me that, that, that there's more to this life than this life. And now my family even picks up on it. If I'm with my wife, we were on, when we were on that sabbatical, we, we seen a snowy egret in Puerto Rico. I was like, Grandma's here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, she would have loved it there. <laughs> but God speaks through his creation. Jesus, right after he gives his prayer, he gives the antidote to anxiety and worry. Right after this prayer, same sermon, Sermon on the Mount. This is what he says. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Why do you worry about clothes? And then he says, look at the flowers of the field, how they grow. They don't labor, they don't spin. So you get the picture here. Jesus is talking about a really big topic, anxiety, worry, stress, and he's telling his the folks listening to go bird watching. <laughs> but there's something there. There's a truth there. We recognize God through his creation. The second thing, I believe we recognize God through others. We recognize God through others. As Jesus continues in the Lord's Prayer, you'll notice that not one time you'll see I or my. It's our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation. It's, it's all plural. And so I think it's this invitation into a mindset that we recognize God when we experience the family of God, when we know that it's not just about me. It's not, it's not I, my, and mine, that we belong to a greater family, and I think that does a few things. I think the first thing it does is it kind of it assassinates selfishness because prayers can sometimes tend to be just my list of things that I want from God. And, and, and Jesus says, no, not one time does he, does he teach us to pray for something for ourselves. It's ours. It's us. It's we. And so he invites us into this thinking that, that, it's more, it's, it, that prayer is more than just me meeting my own individual need. And as I look back on my life, it's, I could tell a lot of stories about how God used somebody else to speak to me. And it's not this weird. I know that sometimes it can be really weird. And I, I do believe that there are times where God gives people a, a, a word for someone, a, a, like a prophetic message. But most of the time, it hasn't been that way for me. When we went to start the church in 2017, um, you know, it was a, it was a pretty pretty big deal to, to leave a good job and to start a church. And people were asking me, well, where are you going to meet? It's like, well, I don't know yet. And I'm like, well, who's going to come? I was like, well, I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, hopefully you, if you want, you know, like I'm, I know my mom will be there, uh, my wife, my son. He was just like a few, you know, he has to come. <laughs> and I, I was a little worried. And, and the, you know, my, my coach that was coaching me to plant 
was like, you don't need to work a job. You need to fully focus on planning this church. And I couldn't do that. And so I just felt like I, I had to work. I needed to make enough money to take care of my family. We just had a child. And, and so I worked surf camp up until we planted the church in September of 2017. And I, I, at the time, Asa was getting to the age where he needed a bed. And so he had a crib, and we, you know, we trans, like we made the crib into it's like kind of a bed, but we didn't have a bed. We needed a bed, and we couldn't really afford a bed. And I just remember just, just, just kind of being mad, like you know, in my prayer time, like God, you're telling me to plant this church, and like I'm having to save up for a bed, which that's not bad, but I, you know, that's just me. I was like, I really wish we, could, you know, could just get a bed. And then I got a text from somebody who's been a part of our church since we planted, a family that lives out here that's an incredible family. And it was just very random. It's like, hey, I just was praying, and I wanted to know if you possibly could use a, a, a kid's bed. I couldn't believe it. I just stopped, and I was, you know, I just, I said, sure. I don't need to see it. I don't care what it looks like. We need a bed. I, sh I pull up, I show up, I got my brother, and we went to the house. I didn't know what it looked like. It was this, it's the coolest bed I've ever seen in my life. Does anybody know what Pottery Barn is? It's a Pottery Barn bed. Like, I would have to put it on layaway now to afford it. You know, like Kmart, you remember that, layaway? And I show up to this house, and there's this beautiful bed that, that, like, that I could have never, like, it's just, it was just only God. And it makes me think that sometimes the more that we have in our life is not for marketplace, that maybe you have more than you need or an extra this or an extra that because God wants to use you to meet a need in somebody else's life. It's the family of God. If I have it, you have it. If I can help you, you know, I'm gonna do it. And I think this is the perspective that, that Jesus is bringing us here into with this prayer. Our Father, you know, daily, our, our, you know, give us, like it's, it's if we, we share and we give and we're generous and it's how people experience God. Oftentimes, you never know when you may be the hands and feet of Jesus. With just something so simple. If God puts it on your heart, that, that homeless person might have been there every day for the last month, but this, this day you, you decided, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy him a meal. I'm gonna buy him, I'm gonna give her something. I'm, I just, you, you never know when you are the answer to somebody else's prayer. And those tiny little impressions are so critical. Those tiny little impressions. Jesus said it like this, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, Brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. We recognize God through others, through the generosity and the caring and the support. The third thing, we recognize God through Jesus, through Jesus. I don't think there's a better example. <laughs> I don't think there's a better, uh, 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 there's not a better model. When I was going through, through uh, Bible college, we we kind of had this competition with each other to see who could, who could read and memorize more of the Bible and who, who could get deeper in theology. And, and it became kind of nasty a little bit, honestly. Like it, it, we started, it just wasn't healthy. And I, I'll never forget one of our teachers said, you know, you can know the Bible and not know Jesus. That Satan knows the Bible better than most, probably any human that's ever lived. We know that. And when it comes to recognizing God, I don't think there's a greater model than his son. And the way that he lived, and the way that he interacted with people, and the way that he treated people. And I heard another, another just that, that when it comes to theology, I don't, I don't know the whole Bible. I don't know all the, the right and wrong theology, but I really believe that Jesus is perfect theology. And the more that I get to know Jesus, the more I'm going to know when something's not not lined up with this book. And then John 1 tells us that Jesus was the word made flesh. So he was a walking Bible. He, he, he is the Bible, that every word we receive from God in some way, some shape or form is gonna be wrapped up in his son. And so we recognize God through Jesus. And most people that I talk to that don't go to church, it's not because of the red letters. It's not because of Jesus and the teaching. It's because of the people that have represented him for the last several decades. It's organized religion that they have a problem with. 
It's really hard to read the, the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and say, I don't really like that guy. You know, just fighting for the poor and healing the sick and sticking up for the fatherless and the homeless. I mean, I don't know if I'm about that. Like, like I've never met anyone that's in that vein. It's always been someone that's represented him that hurt them. But Jesus shows us who God really is. And even when he was alive, people wanted more than just him. They said, we want to see your dad. Show us, show us God the Father. We want to see the CEO who you work for. And Jesus said this, anyone who has seen me, come on, that's it. Anyone who has seen me has seen, the, how can you say, show us the father? He's like, you're looking right at him. <laughs> it's a mystery. You know, it's one God and three persons, but prayer wraps it all up together in one. It's incredible. God in us, praying to God beyond us with the power of God for us. I mean, it's just, then this last thing I, I, I want to share, this has helped me. It's a pretty popular, pretty familiar verse. I actually seen it on a sign yesterday in a church in, their, in a, the kitchen. But I want to read Psalm 46, the few verses before I give you this verse. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. Just listen to it. I didn't give him the verses. Just listen to it. He's our refuge and he's a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall. Though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations that have, are happening on the earth. He makes wars to cease at the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. So do you see what's happening? There's wars, there's pestilence, there's earthquakes, there's a lot of noise. Verse 10, how do you recognize God in all that? Be still and know. And so maybe you don't have a war going on in your life right now, or maybe you're not facing a famine or some kind of natural disaster, but there's people in the world who are. And I've found in my life, it's really, really hard to pray when we're in a hurry. And the world's moving so fast and it's, it's just like, and I know that we're busy and we got stuff going on and we got things to do. Even getting to church is hard and giving one hour a week is tough. And, and, and I, I, I know, but man, there's something that happens when we get still. There's something that happens when we can, when we search out silence and solitude. Because I think God is speaking all the time, that it's this conversation and it's, and it's not in the ways that a lot of times we expect it. It may be a burning bush. It may be a snowy egret. It may be something that, that we'll never see if we're not looking and we're not gonna look if we're moving at the speed of culture. Richard Foster says it like this, in contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will be satisfied. Be still. That word still means to let drop. That there's some things that we carry every day of every week, of every month. And when I say be still, we recognize God when we're still. Part of it is just taking off the backpack that's your life and the rocks that you have and the responsibilities that you have and setting them down for a little bit and just letting it drop. Because if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, and the best way to organize your life is through what God is speaking to you in that moment right now. 
It's hard to hear when we're just, just rushing all the time. And I'm guilty of it. And I'm, I know we live in a fast world that's, that's, a, that's just going nonstop. But how much stillness do you have in your life? Like we live in a culture where boredom is looked down upon. Like, like when's the last time you were bored? You know, when we get bored, we pull out the phone, right? We pull out our, I'll check my email, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, and, and these little, these moments of boredom are portals of prayer where God can get in and speak, these moments of, and, and, and so we just live in a distracted world. And so I just wanna challenge you to just, just get bored this week. Go for a walk with no agenda and get still. Just be happy that you're alive and breathing and start with gratitude and thankfulness. Let's do that now. Just close your eyes. Father, we thank you for your, your goodness in our life, Lord. We thank you that you invite us to a different way of life than what we see in the world. Not striving, not rushing, He said, your yoke is easy. Lord, help us to to find you in the stillness. Lord, lead us, as David said, beside the still waters where we can be restored, where we can put down whatever it is that we've been carrying all week or all month or who knows, maybe our whole life. Where we can take the backpack off and the boulders and put them down and just be in your presence and recognize that your rule is high, high above anything that we can work out in our minds. And that you can make a way through the desert, you can make a way through the storm, that, that you can make a way through impossible situations. Lord, remind us to be still. And so, Lord, in this moment right now, I just pray that you would speak to your children. God, in the stillness of this, just this, this moment, that you would speak into the hearts and lives of your people. You taught us that man can't live on bread alone, but every word that comes, we need a word from you. Our soul lives off of this conversation that we have with you. And so, Lord, speak to your children today, and we just thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen.